Guy on screen here is a man named Joel Webin. I've talked about him a few times on my channels, but I want to talk about him again for a second because apparently he wrote a Christian nationalist constitution, like something that can substitute the U.S. Constitution, and he's pushing for this Christian constitution to replace it. So I want to read the Christian constitution that this guy wrote. If you don't know who he is, let me just like, give a little bit of an intro here. This is where he talks about his ideal world. Uh, that's not the way power works. Evangelicals have to stop viewing power as icky. Uh, biblically speaking and historically, the last 2,000 years of history, uh, both biblically and historically, bottom-up revival is not what God does. I'm not saying he can't do it. I think we should pray for it. But if we're talking about not what God can do or what he will do, what has God done? Statistically speaking, God has done top-down revival, right? So Josiah, comes in as king, and he says, I'm sorry, uh, but the pagan sacrifices will stop by by force. They're done. You're done, right? Uh, that, that's, you know, you have bad king, bad king, and here's the deal. The people, it's it's not that the, the people, if we can just get enough people to be morally better and, and, and be saved, then, then we can elect a good king. No, uh, the people follow the kings. He's saying that he wants to install a dictator who will force Christian belief, force Christian behavior on people. This next clip is from early May 2024. We're degenerates. We're not even close to, more. <laughs> we're degenerates. The Constitution is not, um, is not suited for governing degenerates. No, that's exactly what it's suited for, actually. It was written to govern people of any background or lifestyle or opinion of any sort so that they don't interfere with the rights of others, but they can live their lives with maximal freedom. I don't know where he's getting this idea that the Constitution isn't designed to govern degenerates. Like what? For governing degenerates. Uh, for for governing, governing degenerates, and I'm curious your thoughts on this, if you agree, disagree. Um, but I, I think for our population that is degraded uh, morally and culturally uh, as far and religiously, as far as we have, um, you need power. Um, men must be governed. <laughs> what a weird thing to say. <laughs> you need you need a Caesar type, you know. Now, if you're asking me my preference, that, that would probably be my preference, would be a constitutional republic. Um, but I think the, um, the, the conditions for that is a moral people. So no, no, that's the point of a constitutional republic. People aren't all moral. It's designed to allow people of all lifestyles and moral principles and behaviors and backgrounds and beliefs to live together. Who told him that a constitutional republic like the United States was designed for a moral people and only a moral people? That seems like a pretty big flaw to me. I think you can, you can work towards that in, in the future, uh, but I don't think um, constitutioning even harder is going to get us out of our, our current uh, mess. No, it is actually constitutioning harder. You know, the parts of the constitution that say, no Christian nationalism, no Christianity in government. Yeah, that would solve our problems. The issue is Christian nationalists breaking down parts of the Constitution, trying to reverse the interpretations. Uh, I, I don't see us getting out of this it, apart from things getting worse and worse, and then eventually um, like a Caesar type rising through the ranks, a populist you know, figure in the people you know, the political will, the people that they're, the people are desperate and they're like, yes, do it. So and so. And and then so and so constitution be damned just rules with an iron fist. Dictator. He wants a dictator. The fact that he uses the word populist correctly like this tells me he knows at least a little bit about World War Two, because that's like the most famous example or most famous recent example of populism. He's describing Hitler, a Hitler figure coming in and doing what he wants that person to do or whatever. Oh, and by the way, he hates Jews too. Just rules with an iron fist and, uh, and the, you know, like a Cromwell type. And then, and then you, you know, hopefully. Why, why don't you just say Hitler? Like we all know who you're talking about here. Cromwell type. And then, and then you, you know, hopefully don't get his son. Maybe then you're able, and then you, you, maybe it's just a one generation, one guy kind. Hopefully we don't get a sound. Oh, my God, dude. Anyway, this guy wrote a Christian nationalist constitution. I want to take a look at it. 
Wait, where is it? Where, what did I do with it? It's the Statement on Christian Nationalism and the Gospel. Statement on ChristianNationalism.com is the website. Article 1, The Source of Truth, Affirmations and Denials. We affirm that the Bible is God's Word, breathed out by Him as the only sufficient, certain, inerrant, infallible, necessary, and final authority for all saving knowledge, faith, what we must believe, and obedience, how we must live. This is, remember, a constitution that everybody in the United States is supposed to live under in his ideal world. This is what the government swears by, you know, every day that they open Congress or whatever, in his mind. We affirm that the light of nature in man and God's works in creation and providence reveal God's power and nature. Wow, this is really unnecessarily wordy leaving civil authorities without excuse for failing to govern justly as his servants. The hell does this all mean? Yet, his, uh, yet this knowledge is insufficient for repentance unto life and salvation. All truth claims and ethical standards must be tested by God's final word, which is the scripture alone. We affirm that the Bible is clear in all essential matters. But it's not. The Bible is not clear in all essential matters. That's, that's the problem. That's why we have like 16 billion different denominations. Quick interjection, this won't take long, I promise. I'd appreciate it if you watched to the end of the video or at least a couple extra seconds because YouTube bases its algorithm off of watch time. The more watch time a video has, the further the video will go. Also, take a look at my website, owenmorgan.com. I'm selling my book, Understanding Jehovah's Witnesses, 400 pages, and my second book, 100 Questions for Jehovah's Witnesses, which is about 80 pages. And you can find them both there on the website, audio form, ebook form, whatever. It's about my experiences within the religion and the the history of the religion generally. The 100 questions are intended to challenge a religious leader, so I'd appreciate it if you give it a read. Okay, back to the video. That's why we have people who are anti-abortion, you know, Christians who are anti-abortion, but the Bible is very clearly in favor of abortion, Numbers 5, 11, and 23. That's why we have people who are anti-gay and use the Bible as the basis for all of that, but it only mentions it in six verses total out of 32,000. And even those six verses are not accurately represented by modern-day Christianity. Like, all of these verses that these people use to justify their belief systems are ambiguous and debatable. And also, inerrant? Really? Inerrant? You think it's inerrant? They have a billion different errors throughout the gospel accounts. What do you mean it's inerrant? I'm trying to think of just one example here. Um, the night before Jesus died, was he sitting in a room with his apostles, you know, um, the 12 apostles who followed him around, Judas Iscariot included? Or was he in there with his disciples, like all of his people, everybody who was just like learning from him? Because the Bible has two different opinions on that, depending on which gospel you read. Did the shorter ending of Mark reflect the reality of what happened, or did the longer ending of Mark reflect it? We happen to know for a fact that the longer ending of Mark was added later by monks who wanted to, who didn't like how Mark ended, and they wanted to, like, change the ending. The longer ending of Mark is beyond question false and added later, but it is where you get the basis for, like, Pentecostalism and a whole bunch of other beliefs. Like, Jesus appears to the 11 apostles in the longer ending of Mark, the fake one, and he upbraided them. I've never heard that word. He upbraided them for their lack of faith and stubbornness because they not believed those who saw him after he'd risen. And he said to them, go into all the world and proclaim the good news. This is the basis for soul winning, as some denominations call it, door knocking. The one who believes and is baptized will be saved, but the one who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will accompany those who believe. By using my name, they will cast out demons, exorcisms. They will speak in new tongues, speaking in tongues. They will pick up snakes in their hands, and if they drink a deadly thing, it will not hurt them. This is the basis for snake handling and um, poison drinking. I don't know what it's called, but Pentecostal churches do this. West Virginia is the only state that legally allows snake handling to this day. They will lay their hands on the sick, and they will recover. Faith healing. That's the basis for all the Pentecostal beliefs, all the evangelical beliefs. It's fake. It's all fake. It was added later. The real ending to Mark ended like this. This isn't the shorter ending. This is just how Mark actually ended. The women show up to Jesus' tomb. 
the boulder or whatever, the stone had been rolled back. They entered the tomb. They saw a young man dressed in a white robe sitting on the right side, and they were alarmed. But he said to them, don't be alarmed. You're looking for Jesus of Nazareth, who was crucified. He's been raised. He is not here. Look, there's the place they laid him. But go tell his disciples and Peter that he's going ahead of you to Galilee. There you will see him, just as he told you. So they went out and fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. They said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. The end. That's how it ended. Nobody liked that ending. By the first gospel written here, Mark, and almost certainly the most accurate account. I mean, I don't buy any of this, you know, magical stuff or whatever, but I personally think Jesus really did exist. He was just like a guy. Anyway, inerrant? What do you mean inerrant in this constitution? The Bible's not inerrant, like, at all. It can't be inerrant. It's impossible. And back to the Constitution here. This is Article 1. We deny that true beliefs, good character, or good conduct can be dictated by any authority other than God's revelation. So you can't be good unless you follow God's instructions and all of that, okay? Even when those instructions are bad, like genociding entire groups of people like the Canaanites? Is that good? Article 2. Orthodox Christian faith, we affirm that nations are commanded to honor God by officially affirming the Orthodox Christian faith as historically and universally defined and affirmed in the Orthodox creeds. Okay, we affirm that many denominational confessions articulate the Orthodox Christian faith. We affirm that salvation is by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, revealed in Scripture alone, to the glory of God alone. Okay, wow, that's a lot of alones. We deny that a Christian nation must require or preclude membership in any particular confessional tradition or denomination. So um, orthodox means correct. So people who claim to be like ultra-orthodox literally means like they're very, very correct, except it, in practice it usually means they're really extreme. They're like literalists, fundamentalists. However, orthodox was a denomination of Christianity in its early days. It was the quote-unquote correct interpretation. Then Catholicism, Catholic meaning universal, came along and like took everything over. I'm trying to remember, there's a term called holo-Catholic or something, um, universally spread by fire, I think is what it means. I don't remember now. I'd have to look that up. When Catholics came along, orthodoxy split into Eastern Orthodox and Catholicism. Eastern Orthodox still exists today, and you've got like you know, Orthodox denominations through Russia, that's Russian Orthodox, I believe, and through like Armenia and, you know, the whole area. At the bottom here, it says that they're not promoting any particular denomination. I'm not sure what they mean when they say Orthodox then. Article 3, a, the standard of justice. We affirm that God's word is, orth is authoritative on everything to which it speaks, and we affirm that God's word speaks abund abundantly regarding the nature and importance of civil government and justice. So they're saying um, that we should be following, like, the old Mosaic law? Yeah, it talked about the Mosaic law, but we don't follow that anymore. You know, we eat pork, we eat shellfish, we shave our beards in a V if we want to. That's allowed. We can put two seeds in the same field, two different uh, plants in the same field. We don't follow the old law. The only ones that these people seem to want to follow is like the, the first 10 of the 613, or however many it is. It, it continues on to say, we affirm that God's moral law is enduring and binding on all people throughout all time, including civil authorities and nations, and that is summarily comprehended in the Ten Commandments. But it's not. It was comprehended or like condensed by Jesus when he came along. Love your neighbors yourself, love God with your whole heart, mind, soul, body, strength, and whatever else. That's what the law was supposed to do, ultimately. That was the point of the Mosaic law. That's what Jesus came and did, replaced it with two new commandments. Remember? Am I the only one that remembers this? Like, am I the idiot here? That's possible. I could be the idiot here. How are these people pastors? Did they, like, not read the Bible or something? How did they miss that? It's a pretty important verse. We further affirm that every political thought must be taken captive to the obedience of Christ. We affirm that Christ will judge every civil authority according to their conformity to his command, his being capitalized. So I'm not sure if they believe that Jesus is God, like do they accept the, the Trinity, or 
Or are they saying that Jesus is going to enforce God's commands? I, I'm just like, I'm not sure. I mean, these are really I important points that need to be resolved, right? Before anybody should sign on to anything at all, under any circumstances. Also, one other thing I want to mention, uh, the New Testament did have some bits in there about governing the churches and how you're supposed to go about uh, determining, you know, investigating problems and, and running things, how elders operate and stuff. So it's not just the Old Testament, but it's that's obviously what these people are zeroing in on, the Old Testament laws. They didn't even mention the New Testament laws, as far as I can tell. It was all about, like, the Ten Commandments. We deny that there is any objective standard by which to discern justice from injustice outside of God's revelation, written on the heart, declared in creation, and most perfectly revealed in Scripture. We deny that faithful civil authorities may rule autonomously from the rule of Christ. So you can't operate outside of Christianity, basically. This is actually the definition of nationalism. A lot of people don't know what nationalism specifically means. The denial that any government or whatever has authority to rule outside of your governing authority. Usually nationalist is paired with another word. Christian nationalist, white nationalist, black nationalist, you know, German nationalist, um, national socialist, like socialist, nationalist, that kind of thing. It's usually paired with another word, and that word determines what authority they want to govern. So if you just called a nationalist, it means, in, and you're in America, usually the assumption is that you think that your country, your demographic, is the only one that has a right to rule the earth, and Japan's government, China's government, Germany's, they're all invalidated. And you will do whatever it takes, literally anything, to accomplish your goals. It's an extreme ideology by its very nature. Christian nationalists, as we see here, th these are Christian nationalists that wrote this, believe that their form of Christianity is the only one that has a right to rule. So they're defining Christian nationalism with this, um, this paragraph. We deny that faithful civil authorities may rule autonomously from the rule of Christ. We deny God approves of Christians embracing any political ideology or position contrary to or prohibited by Scripture. And I get like they're quoting a bunch of verses here. See. Article 4, the definition of a nation. Hang on, let me just look at the uh, other articles here. Article 5, the nature of Christ's lordship and kingdom. Article 6, the identity of civil authorities and the source of their authority. Article 7, the duty of civil authorities. Article 8, the purpose of civil government. Nine spheres of authority. Ten on nationalism and policy priorities. Eleven big picture agenda. Twelve on the vocation and calling of Christian officials and legislators. Thirteen the Great Commission. Fourteen the uses of the law. Fifteen on the distinction between law and gospel. Seven uh, no sixteen I'm sorry sixteen on civil disobedience. Okay interesting. Seventeen methodology. 18, Just War, 19, Imagio Dei and Equal Protection, 20, on Neutrality and the Separation of Church and State, and that it looks like that's the end. Wow. Okay, let's look at a couple of different uh, articles here that I want to hit. All right, on Nationalism and Policy Priorities, this is Article 10. Let's see what this says. We affirm that nations possess an inviolable right to establish justice and safeguard the peace and prosperity of their own citizens. Okay, this is counter to nationalism, where other nations have a right to rule. However, it's Christian nationalist in that those nations can operate, but they need to operate according to these people's interpretation of the, of the Bible. So other nations can exist as long as they fall under their belief of the Bible, basically. We affirm that implementing Christian nationalism in each nation will include the punishment of each nation's great evils and promote each nation's thriving. We affirm that each nation's great evils, I'm sorry, we affirm that the specific short-term priorities of Christian nationalism in the context of the United States are to call our nation in her laws, oh, it's a chick, the U.S. is a chick apparently, in her laws formally to acknowledge the lordship of Christ to declare solemn days of humility and repentance, to abolish abortion. Why abolish abortion? 
The Bible is positive about abortion. Numbers 5, 11 to 23 says you should have an abortion if you, for example, don't know if the baby's yours. It even instructs people on how to do it, gives the priest instructions on how to whip up this concoction. Now, it didn't actually work. It was based on the blessing of God, but it instructed people to get abortion is the point here. And it was important because paternal lineage was everything at the time. And the only way that you knew for sure if it was your baby is if the wife wasn't sleeping with anybody else, basically. We affirm that the specific short-term priorities of Christian nationalism in the context of the U.S. are to call our nation in her laws formally to acknowledge the lordship of Christ, to declare solemn days of humility and repentance, to abolish abortion, to define marriage as the covenant union of a biological male and a biological female. Oh, my God. Does, is that what the Bible says? Does the Bible say that marriage is between a man and a woman? No! No, it doesn't. You know how I know? Marriage didn't exist at the time. I should probably back that up. This is Bart Ehrman on the right and Jeffrey Sykes on the left. Bible experts. Been in the field for 40 years, okay? I think Sykes was like one year behind Ehrman in their education 40 years ago. They've authored papers in the field. They're experts, as far as anybody is an expert. Now listen to what Ehrman has to say here. Um, you know, you pick this thing that somebody has an alternative lifestyle that you don't approve of, but you don't, you know, if you don't pick other things, no, you, know, you don't pick somebody who's a glutton, you know, or somebody who is an adulterer. This video is actually about gay marriage and whether God disapproves of it. The answer is no, God doesn't disapprove of it, or at least the Bible doesn't give indication of that because marriage didn't exist. And people who are complaining about it aren't complaining about gluttony or whatever other thing, you know, the seven deadly sins, even though that's not listed in the Bible. But they're not complaining about other sins, lying or whatever. They're zeroing in on hating gay people. Or you you don't, you know, you say, well, okay, you know, I mean, there there are things that don't apply, I mean, to, and so, okay, so, um, I mean, it sounds to me like, you know, it sounds like you and I agree that Paul and Jesus, they probably didn't like the idea of men sleeping with men, but their 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 concept of what that was all about. They didn't have our institution. They didn't have institutions of marriage. I mean, you know, that you like you fall in love, you date somebody and you go, you know, you fall in love and you get married. They didn't have anything like that. And with no. the idea of two adults having a relationship where they decide they want to to have intimacy together, it was like there was nothing like that in the ancient. No. So that's interesting, isn't it? Two Bible experts. Dude on the left is a pastor. He's a Christian pastor. So I don't want to hear any of this nonsense about the Bible supporting biological male and female marriage. At best, Jesus says a man will go off, leave his family, and cleave to a woman or whatever. I don't even remember the verse now. At best, it says that. It doesn't say a man cannot do this or must do that. It just says this is something people do. Anyway, like, these people just don't seem to understand any the first thing about any of this. How are they pastors? How are they, like, religious leaders when they're so uninformed about what the Bible says and what it means and all that other stuff? To define marriage, I mean, again, like, they put abolish abortion. It supports abortion. Like, they get everything wrong. To abolish abortion, to define marriage as a covenant union of a biological male and biological female. I wonder what happens with, like, intersex people. To, de to de-weaponize the federal and state bureaucracies which target Christians for censorship and persecution. Really? To secure our borders and defend against foreign invaders. This is all political BS. The state is not targeting Christians for censorship and persecution. Everybody is equally as free to be whatever religion they want. There are no limits on that until you interfere with my rights to do what I want to do. Christians have just as many rights as Muslims do in the U.S. In fact, Christians have more rights because Christians are actually favored in the U.S. But the persecution part comes in here in their minds because they're not allowed to force it on people. They're not allowed to force teachers to read from the Bible in schools, and that's persecution in their heads. Uh, they're trying to punch somebody in the face and they're being prevented from punching someone in the face, and they're complaining that their rights are being curtailed because they can't do that. That's what's happening. That's this, what, I mean, that's a description of this whole line right here. In fact, this whole document. 
in this bit about defending against foreign invaders. This is just like brazen political nonsense here. To recapture our national sovereignty from godless global entities who present a grave threat to civilization like the United Nations, the WHO, the World Economic Forum, etc., and to exercise restraint in international military intervention and adventurism in overseas democracy building. What is the WEF, I hear you asking, and why do these people give a sh about it? Follow my line of logic here for a second, okay? The World Economic Forum is kind of a, a grouping of the world's richest people who get together, and the WF is like an organization that researches the best places that they can put their money. So Bill Gates, for example, member of the WEF, they do research for him and say, I think that your uh, $50 million would be best spent on polio vaccines for like this African country in the Congo or whatever, because there's a polio epidemic spreading through the Congo right now, you know, for example. So Bill Gates and, you know, any number of other, you know, George Soros and whoever else, they pool their money and they spend the 50 million to improve conditions worldwide. That's what the WEF is, is for, what they do. And they award certain rich people every year. You know, they give them awards for being helpful to society or whatever. So follow my logic here, okay? When COVID hit, the WEF, led by Klaus Schwab, said this is the, the opportune time for a global reset of economies. Like, we can reset economies to benefit the working class rather than the you know, the filthy rich. And filthy rich people involved in the WEF, I think probably most mostly are in favor of that idea. But some filthy rich people are not in favor of that idea, obviously. And suddenly, just like that, a conspiracy theory rises from the ashes about some secretive group that's trying to reset the economy and force communism on everybody and all this other crazy stuff. That's interesting, right? I wonder why those conspiracy theories came about. Who created those conspiracies? Super strange. Do you think it was the, the working class, the poor, who heard them say, hey, we need to help the poor, and then just lost their minds because that's so deeply wrong? I mean, this is like... This document here says the World Economic Forum is evil. It's just the Great Reset conspiracy theory packaged in this Christian nationalist constitution or whatever. This is just wild to me. We affirm that different forms of just government can achieve just laws, and we do not seek to coerce nations into one particular form of government. No, they do. They explicitly said that they do. Following in their founding documents, uh, footsteps, you know, the Bible, following in the Bible's footsteps, giving contradictory statements at different parts, like paragraphs later. That's crazy, dude. We deny that seeking to maintain and assert national sovereignty has anything to do with prejudice against any particular ethnicity or nation. So they're saying we deny that nationalism is prejudiced against any particular ethnicity or nation. We deny that sinful ethnic uh, partiality has any place in the church of Jesus Christ or in a nation that seeks to honor him. On the contrary, a Christian nation would be impartial in judgment. Okay, interesting. N like I said, nationalism is usually paired with another word, white nationalism, Christian nationalism, or whatever, black nationalism even, like I said. When paired with another word, it's commonly linked to racism and, and prejudice and hate for another group. Article 11, Big Picture Agenda, we affirm that the Christian Nationalist Project entails national recognition of essential Christian orthodoxy, Article 2, as a Christian consensus under Jesus Christ, the Supreme Lord and King of all creation, and the establishment of the Ten Commandments as a foundational law of the nation. We affirm the responsibility of civil authorities to protect the soul, not to convert the soul. Okay, wow. This is interesting. So, um... A couple of things here. Alternative option for those who affirm legislating only the second table. Let me explain that real quick. All right. This is back to Joel Webin, because again, Webin signed on to this document. He was one of like a number of different people. 
Webin kind of like explains his th that whole paragraph right there in this video. This is from early May 2024. God appoints some kind of ruler who is unapologetically Christian, and he comes in with a sword and says, I'm sorry, but lawlessness and wickedness will not be tolerated anymore. Okay, this is describing the document. And he doesn't force conversions, just for the record, because that's another one of the objections that's just ill-founded. Right, so then the leader is not going to force people to convert to Christianity. However... He doesn't go around forcing conversions, but instead what he does is he forces external morality. He doesn't force a change of heart. Only the gospel can do that. But what a king can do is he can say, whether you're regenerate or not, um, you're going to pretend... So he's going to force people to act like Christians, whether they're Christians or not. He can't force you to believe in this whole thing, but he will force you to pretend. That's what that line in this thing meant about um, protecting the soul, but not converting the soul, basically. Now, one other thing here. Uh, the establishment of the Ten Commandments as a foundational law of the nation Alternative option for those who affirm legislating only the second table. What is the second table, I hear you asking? Let me show you. He went on Stu Peters' um, TV show. Stu Peters is a Nazi, and he describes what's in this document. Well, listen to this one. This is late June 2024. Adopt a distinctly pre, uh, Christian preamble, and then all, all the Ten Commandments must be legislated. What, what we've done is we thought the second table of the law so second table, meaning commandments five through 10, uh, the commandments of God that pertain to our horizontal relationship with our neighbor, like don't steal, don't murder, these kinds of things. We think that should be legislated by the civil magistrate, but the first table of the law, not that. Um, but that's not true. And I'm not just talking about old covenant Israel in the, in the Old Testament. You look at King Alfred, you look at Constantine, uh, you look at Richard the Lionheart, uh, you look at Duke Godfrey, who, who chopped a, a, a Turk uh, in half diagonally with one swing of the sword. These guys, they legislated both tables of the law. That's where all the prosperity comes from, because you can't hang in midair uh, these second table commandments of don't steal from your neighbor apart from uh, have no other gods before me. Idolatry is the head, the fountainhead of the stream. You cannot have an idolatrous people and yet somehow have a moral people. First table is beliefs, like you must believe that God is good and not, I, not idolize and so on. I guess that means capitalism's out the door, right? I guess we're going to be a communist nation. And second table is like things that you do physically, like stealing or whatever. So this is alternative option for those who affirm legislating only the second table rather than like the idolatry or whatever. We affirm that the Christian nationalist project entails national recognition of essential Christian orthodoxy, Article 2, as a Christian consensus under Jesus Christ, the supreme Lord and King of all creation, and the establishment of the second table of the Ten Commandments, laws 5 through 10, as the foundational law of the nation, with warnings informing citizens of the consequences of blaspheming the one true and living God, often resulting in second table violations, namely the harming of our neighbors' lives and property. We deny that laws against public blasphemy coerce conversion or hinder religious liberty in private. Okay, so uh, you're allowed to be Muslim in private, but you have to act like a Christian in public? This is like, they're trying to turn us into Saudi Arabia, right? It seems pretty, like, dead to rights to me. This is absolutely wild, man. Anyway, tell me what you think about this in the comments. This is something else. Seriously, this is crazy. Get help, people. Normalize therapy. That's, what, that's my uh, recommendation. Normalize therapy.